Well, thank you. I, um, um, I'd like to thank you, Mayor Sonsir, everyone uh, in the Fulbright uh, Chile program uh, for this great opportunity. Um, I'm going to be teaching a, a postgraduate course at the uh, Universidad Católica de Chile and as well as the Universidad de Chile, as I explained. Uh, they are combining you know, their uh, students. Uh, we'll be getting students from both universities, so it's going to be a, a, a very enriching experience. And uh, my course will uh, focus on uh, the Hispanic Caribbean. And uh, it will deal with um, uh, the notion of uh, transculturalism and uh, also transnationalism. From transculturalism, uh, a, a term that uh, captures the uh, uh, the social processes, the cultural processes uh, that the Hispanic Caribbean went through with the arrival of different migrations uh, to transnationalism, because now we have the diaspora. Right? We have created a diaspora uh, in uh, not only the United States but other countries as well. Um, so um, um, my approach to pedagogy and research is the interdisciplinary uh, in nature, and so is the project that uh, brings me here. Um, and it has to do with uh, programs that were created in Cuba in the late 1970s and early 1980s uh, for children of all ages, uh, uh, children of leftist uh, militants from uh, Chile, Argentina, and Guatemala. And they all converged in Cuba around this time. Uh, so, um, next slide. Uh, so, I like this um, uh, quotation uh, by Andreas Fusen because I think it captures the, uh, the, the notion of time, both notions of time that are involved in, in my project. Uh, we're talking about, you know, the Chilean, Argentinian, and Guatemalan militants who uh, were fighting against military dictatorships uh, in their respective countries uh, with the explicit goal of making a better future for themselves and especially their children. They were risking their lives to secure uh, the future. And uh, uh, this idea of the revolution for the benefit of the children is one that comes up uh, frequently in statements by uh, leftist militants of the time, and even you know, Fidel Castro uh, um, addressed it in, in, in several speeches. Um, so roughly, you know, forty not yet. <laughs> roughly forty years have passed, right, since the actions, uh, these actions took place, and not only did the uh, the future the militants were looking for. Uh, did not materialize, but uh, little has been written about this important chapter in the history of uh, Latin America, the Latin American left. Uh, so my goal is to take uh, my informants back in time and try to reconstruct what went on in, in, uh, in that time period. And uh, this is no, uh, no easy task, as I'm finding out. You know, a lot of time has passed, and uh, well, I will be going deeper into what has been done what remains to uh, be done. You know, it's, the it's the inverse of the Operation Pedro Pan. Yes, yes, I will be referring to Operation Pedro Pan as well. Uh -huh. So, next slide, yeah. So, the three programs are the following. The Proyecto Hogares, of the Movimiento de Izquierda Revolucionaria in Chile. Uh, la, uh, la Guardería, uh, of the Montoneros. And uh, Las Colmenas, of the Ejército uh, Guerrillero de los Pobres. Uh, so they ran uh, in the second half of the 1970s and the beginning of the 80s during the fight against the dictatorships in these various countries and the genocide in, in Guatemala. And my, my, uh, my goal is to, um, uh, to study the programs using a comparative approach. So, uh, and uh, you know, the fact that they were converged in, in Cuba. Uh, so next uh, slide. So uh, yes, it, it has to do, you know, I call it, you know, reflection from the continental left uh, because the programs, uh, you know, were kind of uh, conceived, right, uh, by Chilean, Argentinian, and Guatemalan uh, militants. Uh, also because, uh, you know, Las Colmenas, the Guatemalan Las Colmenas, for example, ran first in Mexico. So that, that's where they went first. And uh, 
uh, but then moved to Nicaragua after the triumph of the Sandinista Revolution. And when the Contra attacks intensified, they moved to Cuba. So, you know, they moved around a lot, and, uh, and of course they all took advantage of the networks of, of leftist militants that were created uh, and that appeared to have been very strong. Um, so next. So this is the kind of violence that the revolutionaries tried to uh, spare their children from. Um, as the various uh, records suggest, children were not spared from uh, widespread uh, state violence, uh, either directly or indirectly. Right? Uh, uh, these figures are very um, telling uh, in that respect. Uh, so, and for example, uh, you know, Macarena Aguiló, the director of uh, El Edificio de los Chilenos, uh -huh, was kidnapped as a little girl. You know, she was five, six years old, kidnapped by the military briefly as a way to uh, you know, pressure her parents who had fled, who had to, you know, went underground, um, as, as a way to pressure her parents to uh, you know, come out into the open. And, uh, uh, and there were many children who participated in these programs that uh, lost their parents. So, um, so my goals. Uh -huh. So the first is to recover many voices, many of the voices of the founders, promoters, and all participants in the program as possible using the, the, uh, the, the oral history work. So most of what we have is in the voice of the second generation. Mm -hmm. you know, I refer to Magdalena Lilo, for example, the daughter of uh, the militants. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I, I'd like to, um, to, you know, to look more closely at you know, the, the motivations uh, of, the, of, the, of the first generation, uh, the, the people who the parents and other people who made the decision to, to create these programs. The Miristas. Huh? The Mirista. Or Mir yes. Uh -huh. Mirista, I was going to ask if you, were gonna, if you were going to interview Miristas or former yes, Miristas. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so, you know, I, I think that it's important to recover these voices. And uh, because the second generation has a different perspective. Okay. Uh, and you know we need to engage with the horizon of possibilities that are embedded you know, in, in this historical period in order to really understand and, uh, uh, you know, those decisions. Um, so the next one is to place these programs in dialogue with one another so that a fuller picture emerges out of a continental context. Uh, so this is not merely a personal or even a national story. So what has been done is very uh, limited to each country. And uh, uh, yet, you know, it, there is obviously, you know, a different context to, to, to these programs. And uh, so my intention is to redraw the boundaries of the stories and shift the center of attention to uh, the programs coming together in Cuba. Uh, and this is not, you know, a unique story only. As we mentioned, the Operación Pedro Pan uh -huh, um, in, of the early 1960s in Cuba, and, uh, uh, and it would go even further in time, you know, children of the Holocaust, the Spanish Civil War, and, uh, um, you know, there is a history about, you know, separation uh, between parents and children, and I think it is a very timely history that we are witnessing. Um, okay, so. Um, the next one is to flesh out the difference and similitudes, so different and yet the same, in terms of you know the structure of the program and uh, uh, the kind of support they received. Um, and I think it would be interesting to see those differences as well as similarities. Are there um, memoirs from the children involved? I'm sorry. Are there any memoirs from either the children or the? Parents? I would. I would talk about that. Uh, and, uh, you know, finally to obtain as much factual information as, uh, as possible in terms of, you know, the sad dates, what the programs ran, how many children were involved, um, how exactly, you know, they operated. Uh, uh, so, yeah, that's one of my goals. 
Now let's go to some of the challenges, right? Um, so so uh, there's limited public information available besides three documentaries that were produced. And, and, and I will be talking about the three documentaries in just a minute. Uh, and there is also a book on the, uh, you know, on, on the Argentinian. Uh, so lack of access to archives. Um, this is very important because it, you know, the, the, these programs ran were semi-clandestine, right? So there, there isn't really uh, anything to be found in the press of the times. Um, and uh, you know, the, the, the Cuban government, for example, uh, maintained diplomatic relations with uh, the Argentinian junta. So it was in no position to, you know, to to to, uh, to also recognize <laughs> that he was supporting the, the the people who were trying to overthrow the junta. Uh -huh. So that's the kind of situation that we have to deal with. Now there must be archives in uh, in Cuba because it, this program was, um, let's say, uh, supervised by the Departamento de América of the state uh, of the Cuban state. Uh, but those archives are not open to the public. What about the church? Huh? Church. The church? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they have a vicaria de solidaridad. Ah, uh, you mean Chile. here? Here sí. in Chile. Uh -huh. Okay, so well, that's not only in Chile, I mean, in Argentina also. The yes. church has a lot to, to say about. Uh -huh. You know a lot. Okay, so I need to yeah, talk to you about that, exactly. Uh -huh. uh, yes, and I'm sure, you know, and the, the Museo de la Memoria, too, has a Centro de Documentación, right? Sí. Uh, I need to Did the children stay in Cuba? I'm sorry? What happened to the children? To, the, to the children? The children um, went back to their respective countries, most of them, not all. Uh -huh. um, and some took longer to return than others. You know, the Argentinian pro pro program was probably the shortest. Uh, um, um, in, in Chile, you know, they came back at different times. Uh, it was the Mans too. Uh, now, I'm gonna be talking about the three documentaries in a minute, so you can get more details about that. Uh, you know, there is also some reluctance to speak about the heart-wrenching decision to separate from, from the from children, of course. Uh, especially if, uh, you know, things did, did not turn out the way the parents expected it. You know, they were fighting for a bright future that never really arrived. So, you know, why did I make this sacrifice, right? Yeah. That's, um, there's a lot of, you know, Especially after 1990. Yes. So, um, um, but you know, little by little, you know, I've been making some progress. Uh, I've been working on this project for at least two years, uh, building, you know, uh, trying to reach out to the people who are involved, and uh, I've done some interviews already. Uh, Do you know Aldo Marchesi? Uruguay. He works on the continental left uh -huh. uh, from, from Uruguay, but looking at Montevideo as like a portal for the continental left. Yeah. 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 So, and there is also, you know, human displacement and, and the loss of nature. A lot of people left you know, didn't come back. You know. Or, uh, you know, they're, they're, most of them are in their 70s. And so this is... Uh, yeah to hurry, <laughs> right, in order to be able to, uh, to secure uh, those, those stories. Um, so as I was saying, so these are the three documentaries that have been made. Uh, the first one is El Edificio de los Chilenos uh, uh, by Macarena Amilo. Uh, she calls it El Edificio de los Chilenos because uh, there was a building in, uh, in uh, the, the section of Havana, Alamar, uh, that was built after the revolution, uh, occupied by, by the Chilenos. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and, and then there is La Guarderia by Virginia Croato, uh, 
uh, produced in 2016, and Las Colmenas by Alejandro Ramirez Anderson, uh -huh. uh, that was the first in 2007. Uh -huh. And you can watch them all online, actually. Uh -huh. And uh, so, you know, these are all made from that point of view, the point of view of the second generation. Um, and uh, uh, they were made in less than a decade, beginning in 2007. Uh, before that, there was, uh, you know, there, there, there was no information about these programs. La Guardería es? La Guardería es de los Argentinos. And that's the, that the word they use for the... Uh, but these, this is the generation who lived in Cuba. Yes, these exactly, are the children. exactly. Uh, these were the children who are now in their 40s. Right. So, um, and uh, so, you know, I mean, there, there are certain points in common uh, among the documentaries, but there are also differences. So, so the next slide. Uh -huh. We have so this is a, uh, a, a panel that I organized for the uh, plaza that took place in Boston in, uh, this past May. And for the first time, you know, uh, the, the three directors uh, came together as a group. Uh -huh. uh, they knew about the documentaries, of course, but they, they hadn't met before. Uh -huh. uh, so they, they were there as well as one of the mothers, Susana Bradinelli, Virginia Croato's mother and Jorge Barudi Labrin, who's a uh, psychiatrist, who uh, advised the, the Chileans on, on the uh, Proyecto Bogares. And it was a very successful panel. Um, they offered the testimonies, and uh, uh, it was, you know, the, the, the audience uh, reacted very well to it. Um, and next, you're going to want to see a, um, a picture taken at that time. Uh, so this, um, I was able to get support of the four foundation and the Social Science Research Council, uh, and, and uh, you know it was essential, it was vital, uh, because they came from various places: Argentina, Chile, um, uh, Alejandro Ramirez, who now lives in Ecuador, and Jorge Barudi, who is now stationed in uh, in Barcelona. Um, these are the three, uh, the, the three directors of the documentaries. Uh, Macarena Aguiló, Alejandro uh, Ramirez Anderson, and uh, Virginia. Uh, Hijo de chilenos. Uh, no, the, the left one. one. On Aguiló. The Chilean. one on the left uh -huh. is the daughter of uh, Chilean uh, ministers. And the other two? The, this, the one in the middle is from Ejército Guerrillero de los Pobres. Oh, the Guatemala. OK. And on the right? And Argentina. Oh, I see, I see. Uh, Virginia Croato. But they didn't know each other, did they know each other in Cuba? No, 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 they didn't. They didn't know about, about each other. How many children are we talking about? So it depends, you know, and that's not very, uh, you know, I, I think that in the case of, uh, of the Chileans, there were about 80. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure about the Argentinians or the Guatemalans. That's something that you know, needs to be really. We, we don't have an exact figure. Alejandro Ramirez Anderson. So uh, and this is a, a clip. Oh. Uh, so before you click on it. So okay. this, this was at the end of the panel, and uh, this is just a reaction from, from the audience. Uh, this is someone that I happen to know, Emilio Cueto, who went uh, through the experience of the uh, Pedro Pan operation. Uh, oh, he's Cuban? Yes, he's Cuban. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, the Pedro Pan op operation, for those who don't know about it, uh, was a program uh, created um, with the support of the, uh, of the Catholic Church and the U.S. State Department that allowed over 14,000 children, Cuban children, to go to the U.S. unaccompanied. Uh, this was in the very early 1960s, and uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, parents losing you know, control over their children, and yeah. Uh, 
So they sent their children to, to the U.S. and they were put in camps and later, you know, with families. Uh, um, and uh, some of them, some of them um, weren't able to uh, reunite with their parents because, you know, in 1962 there was a missile crisis and all flights are canceled. So, uh, you know, there, there was a long period of separation at times between parents and children. So you tenemos una sensación de pertenencia, fuimos para las familias, nos dieron ese afecto de cada. Son 400 personas, o sea, estamos hablando de un proyecto inmenso. Eh, también lleno de contradicción, personas heridas emocionales profundas que no entendían que puesto extraordinariamente cómo se les quitaba al niño que no había un abandono en muchos casos estos muchachitos de 7 8 años que salían no podían entender por qué sus padres lo habían mandado fuera en algunos casos hubo reencuentros rápidos en mi caso no fue así el gobierno cubano no me permitió ver a mi madre por 16 años es parte de, de mi equipa eh, les agradezco profundamente así que a, 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 he aprendido que Cuba tuvo una operación pero para el revés y eso para mí ha sido extraordinariamente valioso y les agradezco muchísimo a los padres primero por haber pensado en sus hijos enormemente porque yo pienso el dolor de mi madre y a usted por haber tratado de paliar ese dolor muchas gracias when he said I thank the parents was he saying he thanks the, their parents for having sent them to Cuba is that what he meant yes yeah. that's because they asked the they didn't even know what was going on but he also said he was separated from his parents for 16 years small for 16 years but he still says this was this was a positive thing mm -hmm. and it's ironic because he's thankful that he left Cuba but he's thanking them for having been sent to Cuba right <laughs> So the idea was sanctuary either way. Yes. Not, yeah. right. Transcendent of ideology in some sense. <laughs> the situations were not exactly the same, you know. No, I right. mean, in the case of Cuba, there was a rumor. You know, we right, there was a lot of just fear, that especially in that early happen, moment. Right, uh, right. But nothing actually happened. Right, uh, right, right, right. Exactly. Right. Now the states were very different. Of Argentina, Chile, and Guatemala. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was real battle. Right. Sure.